All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Jeremy, I've made you a co-host, so if you get notifications that folks are joining, will you let them into the meeting? Okay. Uh, sometimes I can't see them as they come in when we get going. Yep. Um, the first thing I'd like to start with tonight, um, over the weekend, we had a couple of things happen um, and, and we've had residents reaching out with concerns. So the first thing that happened Saturday evening, there was a shooting uh, in our neighborhood and an 18 year old young man died as a result of his injuries related to that shooting. And I just wanted to take a moment to recognize that and to, to extend both our sympathies to, to his family and, and our condolences to the neighbors. There, there were several neighbors in that area right around the, the, the family home there that, that, experienced, that witnessed it and, and have had been having a hard time. So if you are, are someone that witnessed that and you need support or you need help finding resources, please let us know. Um, and the second thing we had a, on Sunday night, we had a, a, another young man who was struck by a vehicle on 1700 South and it was a hit and run. And he is in intensive care in a, from what I understand, a, a medically induced coma. And we just wanna extend our, again, our, our sympathy and, and our condolences to his family. Um, we, we plan to do a GoFundMe for the families uh, when they've had a time, had a chance to, uh, to, to, to come to terms with what's happened. And when they're comfortable reaching out to us for support, we'll be sure uh, to provide that. Um, is there anyone that uh, need, would like to say anything about that or, or have any questions? All right. Um, if you have questions as they come up, you can either put them in the chat or feel free to, to, to ask them. Um, I haven't seen that Detective Oliver has joined. Is that, it doesn't look like he has. Um, yeah, I don't see him yet. Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to do, Ken, I'm going to ask if Ken from Sorensen Unity Center has any updates um, and let him give announcements and, and any uh, updates that he has. Uh, thanks, Turner. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> I'm Ken Perko with the Sorensen Community Campus, the Unity Center, and the Multicultural Center on Ninth West in California. Um, unfortunately, the update is that the campus is uh, closed to the program to the public for recreation programming. Um, given the spike um, in COVID numbers, um, we closed last week and are going to remain closed indefinitely at this point. The exceptions being that the Salt Lake Donated Dental Services Clinic is still open um, for appointments um, and we have an early Head Start program that's still operating. We also um, operate a youth program and a teen program. We closed those programs but they should be reopening hopefully the first week of December um, but we're still not totally sure about that. Um, <clears throat> A good news thing is that we have our final meeting and walkthrough for the construction project that was a big part of renovation of the multicultural center, which started, which feels like, I don't know, five lifetimes ago in December of 2019. Um, but that work has finally been completed. Um, that was a renovation of gym locker rooms, um, as well as a lot of um, mechanical upgrades. Um, we're still going to be upgrading the HVAC, the heat and air conditioning in the pool area. That hopefully will get started in February. Um, but I guess, I don't know, this is, it's so hard to be like, yay, the construction's done, people can't come in. Um, but we're hoping that we'll be open to the public again within the next few weeks. Um, but we're going to kind of base that on how the numbers go. Um, so that's pretty much the update. The, well, the, the one thing I do want to just kind of make sure everybody's aware of is that we do have a, a very expanded Wi-Fi network on the campus. So um, if anyone needs um, a place to get Wi-Fi access, um, we've put some 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 uh, Wi-Fi hotspots on the uh, outside of the Unity Center. And so, you know, you can sit on the plaza. We have outdoor seating. You can also sit in your car in the parking lot. And it's a free and totally accessible Wi-Fi network through the City Connect program. Um, and that is up and running. And um, so I would encourage folks, if they 
looking for a place to get Wi-Fi that is still operating, even though we're not open in the buildings. Um, and then if anybody has any questions, I'd love to have questions. All right. Thank you. Does anyone else have uh, any updates that they'd like to give or announcements they'd like to make? I just put in the chat and I will share on Facebook uh, in just a moment, a link to a vaccine clinic, a flu vaccination clinic that's happening tomorrow at Glendale Mountain View Community Learning Center. So if you need your flu shot, um, there's never been a more important year to get a flu shot because we can't have a, a really bad flu season on top of the coronavirus. It would be devastating to our, our medical resources. Uh, any, any other announcements that would, you'd like to make? All right, uh, so I'll move on to the next thing. I have a question. Oh. I, I just put it up on chat. Oh, yes. I, I'm just very curious. Do you, are you, do you have plans or did, was part of the construction upgrade in increasing or improving the ventilation system in the gym area? Um, uh, so yes, in the, the basketball gym, in the mul all, of the, all of this work was done in the multicultural center building. So not the not the fitness center as we call it in the Unity Center. Is there um, a plan for that? Because I would love to go back to the gym, but even as things get better with coronavirus, I'd love to know that there's just a really good ventilation system. Um, that, no that plans. Is, no, no plans. Um, okay. I think that's that's good to know. Um, yeah. It would just I, I make folks more comfortable coming back, I think. But, okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. Sure thing. Thanks. Uh, sorry that I didn't see that in the chat, Amy. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, to Josh from the, the mayor's office. Hey, everyone. Thanks, Turner. So uh, I'm Josh Raboyo from the mayor's office. I'm the community liaison for uh, District 2. Uh, I do have just a few things to share, uh, updates from our office and uh, some resources to share. So the city, uh, Tax Help Utah, in partnership with the city, uh, the mayor's office, and uh, Haley Leak in our office in particular, are helping people who have not received the first round well, at first and only round of stimulus checks from this year uh, to help those that have not received that um, because they did not file taxes in 2019 to be able to receive a stimulus check. And so the assistance for that is actually um, ongoing this week, uh, tomorrow and on Friday and on Monday at uh, on the corner of 3rd East and 1st South and office building there. And you can actually find more information about that on the city's uh, Facebook page, which is the SLC government page. Um, and you can find out more information about that if that applies to you or to anyone you know. Uh, that is uh, important information to know because the deadline for that is uh, the 21st. And uh, is it all right if I share my screen, Turner? Yes, let me fix that real quick. Okay, you should be able to now. All right, just a second. All right, is that pulling up? That... Okay, so I just wanted to share this resource that I've, I've brought around to uh, community councils in the past when we used to meet in person, I would, you know, usually bring a bunch of flyers and, and different things from, from the city for people to take home. But, you know, since we're virtual, I'm not able to hand those out. But one of those that I continue, we continually bring around is the Good Neighbor Guide in the city, which uh, contains good resources for basically any basic city need that you might have, whether it relates to um, uh, civil enforcement or lighting or garbage cans or graffiti or whatever it might be. Um, the, all the phone numbers are on this page. And uh, so that's a good resource to have. I'm gonna share that in the chat. 
And uh, that can actually be found on the, uh, the city website, just search Salt Lake City Community Councils and you can find the Good Neighbor Guide on there. We're always updating this. Uh, most of these numbers, all of these should be uh, current and correct uh, as far as the phone numbers and websites go. So that's just a good resource to have if you're having a question about who to contact within the city for a given issue. In addition to that, I would uh, also remind people about the SLC mobile app, which can be downloaded on the app store for your iPhone or for your Android device. And that is also a good resource to report issues in the city um, related to any number of things. Could be from public utilities to issues on your street, uh, issues concerning homelessness or, or trash. And so that, that is another resource as well. So, and I, yeah, I'm gonna stop right actually right now for now. Do you, is there any questions regarding what I've shared already? Okay, great. Um, so I did wanna just share an opportunity that's come from our city's uh, uh, urban forestry division that uh, would apply to all our community councils in the city. And so, as you know, one of the mayor's uh, initiatives has been to plant a thousand trees, uh, in particular on the west side, to increase the urban canopy. And that's something that is an even greater need after the uh, large windstorm from September. And uh, so, so in order to maintain those trees, a lot of care is required uh, to ensure that they are uh, successful as they're planted and that they uh, you know, take root and are, are continuing to grow. Um, and so the urban forestry division of the city, though they are in charge of maintaining and, and caring for trees with, on the Zon City property that is in the parks and park strips, uh, they, all, they proposed that community councils throughout the city can create a urban forestry subcommittee. And as you can see from this flyer, the uh, purpose of that is to ensure that trees located in the boundaries of your community council are receiving the care that they need, especially when it comes to watering. And so um, urban forestry is still formulating uh, a plan for these subcommittees as they are formed. I know at least uh, Rose Park has formed one and uh, a, a few others uh, community councils throughout the city have formed these subcommittees and uh, so I just wanted to bring that to your attention and uh, for anyone in the community who may be interested in heading up a committee or this basically just, just volunteers that are gonna look out for trees in the area. And uh, I would, I, you could reach out to me or uh, reach out to uh, Turner and Turner, you can keep me informed if anyone is interested in, uh, in taking advantage of that opportunity to be on this subcommittee and uh, you'll have more direction coming from our uh, urban forestry uh, director, Tony Gliot, in the coming weeks and months for that. Thanks, All right. Just to give any, you uh, any, que yeah. any, oh, any questions on that or on anything else? All right. All right. Thanks for that comment, Amy. Appreciate that. And uh, I will, okay, I'll take your, take note of your email and take note that you're interested in that then. Thank you. And yeah, the, as far as that goes, there's not a ton of direction right now. They do want to make sure that these are probably gonna hit the ground running next year. Um, so we're heading into the, the winter months and it's a little more difficult, but as we head into the spring and it's important that those trees as they continue to be planted that they're taken care of, that'll uh, be very important, so. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And uh, if there's no other questions, I'll go ahead and uh, give up my time and go turn it back to Turner. Thanks, Josh. Um, and to give those that are watching an idea of, of how we're approaching the, the Urban Forestry Subcommittee, we have been, for those of you that uh, don't know, we have been in the process of creating a, an affiliate of Keep America Beautiful here in Glendale called Keep Glendale Beautiful. So we had started on this work before the COVID-19 crisis. We've done a few cleanups, but in the spring we plan to get more active um, and, and do more community cleanups and 
that type of thing. And we we feel that the the urban or the <clears throat> this urban forestry subcommittee actually dovetails really nicely with some of the work that Keep Glendale Beautiful will be doing. And so we we plan to be very active and, and to have our own subcommittee. Um, thanks, Josh. Um, thanks. Actually, can I just share one more thing? Yes. I'm sorry, just one other opportunity that I forgot to uh, to mention. So Salt Lake City and the uh, Public Library in partnership with the United uh, Jewish Federation of Utah and Community Partners Against Hate are having a uh, an event in the community conversation series called Rising, the Rising Rate of Hate Crimes in the United States in Utah. And that's actually a, a web, what, web seminar, webinar that is gonna be uh, hosted over Zoom. And that's actually this Thursday at 7 p.m. And that's gonna be live streamed on uh, the SLC government Facebook page. And uh, there's gonna feature some panelists from the Southern Poverty Law Center and from other uh, organizations and the mayor as well will be uh, taking part in that. Uh, webinar. So don't, for those that are interested, that's on Thursday at seven. Thanks, Josh. Uh, any Thanks. questions for Josh? All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and turn it over to Detective Oliver. I see that you were able to join. Uh, thanks for, for uh, joining tonight, Detective Oliver. Yeah, sorry. I couldn't log in um, the first time. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, are there any questions, uh, concerns, any uh, issues you're seeing in your neighborhoods right now that that uh, need to be brought up? We can maybe talk about that before I go into some of the boring numbers. I, I'm wondering if you have any more uh, information on the shooting that occurred over the weekend at 11th, I believe it was 11th West and 950 South. Uh, I do not have any more than other than what KSL's put out. Um, I usually, sad to say, I usually get more of my information from KSL than I do through the, through the, the channels here. Um, so if, if it's been reported on KSL, that's pretty much what I know. I can do a little bit more digging though and, and give you some updates that maybe you could put out uh, on your, your Facebook site. That would be great. Um, this is, I have a comment. This is Ray. Sure. Hey, Ray. Hey, um, I'm wondering if Detective Oliver could do a little more digging if necessary and tell us what's going on with these shootings we've had in Glendale. I believe there have been two of them fairly close to my house. I'm at the end of Mead Avenue on the west bank of the Jordan River. Uh -huh. And I heard one of these shootings happen, I think it was about two weeks ago. And it seems like there's gangland warfare underway. I mean, that shooting, there were probably 10 to 15 shots altogether. Uh, some of them close together, it was sounding like they might have been an automatic weapon. Right across the river from my house, as best I could tell. And both, I think there were two reports actually in the Tribune and Deseret News about two incidents within about a one to two week, let's say a two week time frame. Uh, I couldn't find both reports in the news, but I think they were both reported in the news. And uh, I'm also, I'd also like to ask uh, Detective Oliver to comment on the $5 million reduction in budget for the Salt Lake City Police. And uh, I've heard that there's a task force community intelligence, I don't know what they do. Sounds like a great idea to have community intelligence um, and that they're being defunded. What is that? What do they do? How can we get a grip on what's really going on uh, with gang, what seemed to me gang shootings? These are not related to robberies. What right. else would people be shooting 15 bullets uh, for if not some kind of gang activity. You're, you're hundred percent right, Ray. Um, majority of the shootings in Glendale are gang. Well, I'm going to say almost all the shootings lately have been gang retaliation or gang involvement. Um, and you can see it in the news. If you have a, a gang shooting in Taylorsville, or if, you, if there's a, a drive-by in West Valley, um, depending on what 
section or what group, uh, what gang it is, you can see the retaliation that will be occurring. So we do have um, the gang, our gang uh, squad, and as well as the uh, gang task force that, that are trying to, to keep an eye on that. Um, but you're right. It is gang involvement. Um, and usually it's, it's the younger members of the gangs that are doing the shootings right now. Um, as far as I don't, I don't really have a whole lot to tell you on the five, the 5 million, um, cut or whatever, that might be a better question for some, uh, some others on the panel or, or, or they're here tonight, but I can tell you that the, the criminal or the, um, community intelligence unit is being defunded that's that's the squad that i'm on so um there's seven of us that were representing the districts and uh, we're all going back to patrol there will be three spots open for a community um policing group and so there will be three officers instead of seven through the city um so that's a little bit discouraging in the sense that uh you know all the the relationships i've been able to create um, over the last couple of years, uh, will be kind of, um, I'm going to try not to forget them, but being back in patrol is going to be a little bit harder to work with. So I am going to put in for the, the new position in the cop squad. Um, hopefully we can get that and we can maintain the relationship on the West side that we've had. So, okay. but, yeah. Do I have a question? Have, last thing that up. you mentioned, that I'm sorry. Cop squad. Is that what, what it's called? Yeah, it's a community um, oriented policing squad. And it's basically the same thing. Uh, it's, it's focused on the community on ways that we can help uh, different, different areas, uh, kind of like what we're doing now. It's just they're changing it from seven to three. So that's where the cut's coming from. I see. So I have a follow up question on that. Why sure. on earth are they defunding something that is so, I mean, it's minimal and we need more of it, if anything, community policing. I mean, why would why on earth would they defund that? Who's making those decisions? Um, that's that's all decisions way above me. I know, I but know. where? <laughs> it's it, it comes down to the chief and in um, the mayor's office deciding on where the cuts need to be need to come from. Mm -hmm. So um, that's really. I mean, you could always reach out to the the chief through his office, the uh, office of the chief, and mm -hmm. ask them that question. Um, I just know that they told us we were being. Uh, we were being disbanded and we would be going back to patrol. I see. Thank Detective you. Detective Oliver, I yeah. want to thank you for being such a, a good uh, liaison to the community. You've always been uh, so helpful and willing to listen. I really appreciate that. I hate to see that being diminished if, if that's what's happening. Sounds like there's another way to... to continue for I gather that this community intelligence is basically you coming to the community council meetings to hear what people are concerned about and report on crime statistics is that yeah yeah that's what yes. correct so I'd like to uh, I'd like to ask Andrew Johnson also to comment on the five million dollar cut I don't even know what the police budget for Salt Lake City is that may be a very small piece of it are we seeing across the board cuts, Andrew, because the city no longer is able to sustain its revenue from taxes because of people out of work for COVID? Uh, Ray, if, it, if it's okay, I'd like to parking lot that question. Andrew Johnston is next on our list um, of okay. speakers. Can we have Detective Oliver just do re, re, report out the sure. data and then we'll move on to, to Council Member Johnston? Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you. I have a question as well related to the query that. Detective Oliver, yeah. I, would you I, mind I, just I, reporting out the data information? Sure. Sure. So, um, so in the last two weeks, we've had a, a pretty, inc a pretty significant increase in some of the crime in, in District Two, uh, District Two, of course, Poplar Grove, um, and Glendale, and then parts of Fair Park. Uh, the most significant increase has been in um, robberies, which is non-business robberies, which is usually a personal robbery. And that has gone up in the past year by 41.1%. So that's one of the concerns we have right now that we're trying to maintain to see if it's a group of individuals, if it's one individual, um, especially in the District 2 area. 
another significant increase has been um, aggravated assault non-family, which is a, usually uh, ag assaults are um, any kind of fight that where a possible weapon is involved. And that has gone up, let me get back to my page, that one's been up 18.3% in the last year. Um, so overall, our total violent crimes in District 2 has, has gone up 10.1%. Uh, not an increase, not, or not a, something we like to see. Absolutely don't like to see that um, increase. We'd like to see it in, you know, dropping instead of going up. So that's something that we're, we're trying to head off before it gets too involved. Um, but yeah, that's, those are our increased numbers for, for as of year to date for right now. Any other questions on, the, on that? Detective I, Oliver, um, are, are you able to compare us to the rest of the city and with a, a statistic in any way? I can do, yeah, I can do a quick, just a, like compared to district one, uh, they have year to date, they've actually gone up 90, let's see, in family assaults, they've gone up 92%. So that's a huge increase uh, above and beyond what Glendale um, or district two has. They've gone up 34% in robberies. So overall, District 1's gone up 32.8% compared to um, only the 10% that uh, District 2 has. Uh, if you want to look at District 3, District 3's gone up 24% in the last uh, year to date for total violent crimes. So that's a, that's a significant increase um, over Glen, Glendale or District 2 as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I like to see that we're on the lower end, but it's still way too high of numbers for for anybody to be comfortable or happy with. Thank you. You bet. So I have, forgive me for chiming in yet again. Give me a little credit. I haven't been on the airwaves for a long time. It has but, been a lot. Um, I, I wanna make a suggestion that Turner, who is, I believe now the executive manager for the Westview, assign some reporter or himself or Charlotte get together with uh, Detective Oliver and do a, for the upcoming edition of the Westview, a report comparing sort of the west side to the east side. There's, we all know that there's been a steady drumbeat of, of complaint, complaints from our west side neighborhoods. We don't get the same kind of services from the city that the east side gets. I don't know if that's true, but it would be interesting to, to know where the crime is for all districts of the city and just have a comprehensive report on that. And particularly with respect to this gang activity, which is seems to be on the rise on the west side here. Maybe it's happening all over the whole city equally. I don't know. But and then look at that in comparison with the where is the defunding and the reductions in force that we're hearing about. Just a suggestion. We're looking at, at contracting a journalist to do that. Hey, Turner. Yes. Hey, I just want just, just to, just to comprehend these numbers just a little bit. When I said uh, District 2 is 10.1, so they've had 200, or District 2 has 295 um, violent crimes. So we are up, you know, 10% of that. If I just look at District 7, which is, of course, the East Bench side, um, theirs has gone up 43.2%, but they've only had 106 violent crimes. So you could say the percentages, you know, are, are significant, but when you look at the total numbers, um, the West side is still getting hit pretty hard that we need to, we need to get a, a grasp on that. So that's going to be our focus, um, at least until until January 10th, until I figure out where I'm going back to patrol or, or into this cop squad. So, okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question from DB. Uh, DB, do you want to ask Detective Oliver instead of me reading your comment? Sure, I can do that. Thanks. Um, basically, there's been a squatter camp in Benjamin River Park for over a month and going on two months. And Andrew's helped with this. Detective Oliver, thank you. I'm sorry to hear that they're starting that program. I'm sure that's a sign of dire circumstances, actually, in, in the court. Uh, and we just abuse the man. Uh, that's, uh, that's just my guess. So thank you.
thank you for everything that you've done. But while you're still here, is there any, anything you can do about this camp? They brought in propane tanks. They put another tank up yesterday. They've got a fairly seemingly kind of permanent shelter that you know looks like it's there to weather the winter. Yeah, DB, we, we absolutely can. And Josh, if we want to put that on our on our cat, um, uh, we have a community action team. If we want to put that on the list to get uh, the health department and also code enforcement over there again to take a peek at that, uh, that'd be great. But yes, we will absolutely be on that, DB. Thank you. Um, in, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to Council Member Johnston. Uh, and I, and I apologize, council member, if I cut you off earlier, there was a little bit of feedback uh, and I apologize if I cut you off as you were responding. No, no, you're fine. It's your meeting, man. Um, uh, so Dave uh, Troster, we, we have spoken about the Bend in the River one and uh, the city has put on the CAT team um, radar as well as the county health department. The issue probably is just the volume of things they're responding to, but um, I think if, if Detective Oliver can follow up, that'd be certainly helpful on that particular camp. Um, let's go back to Ray's question about the police budget. So um, we passed the budget this year that kept their funding flat from last year. That means that the increases that had been planned were not done. So there was a hiring freeze on new officers that had been planned and some other things. That, would, that didn't happen. That's where the savings came in the budget from a de decrease we're projecting this year. Um, I don't know anything about a $5 million decrease though, right? To be honest with you, I haven't heard that at all. We didn't do that on our end. Um, and so I'd have to sort of get more information from what, what, where that's coming from. The CIU change is coming from the police department itself, as far as I'm aware at this point. Um, I'm still trying to get a hold of Chief to talk through it. Um, my understanding, and this is from working through, uh, through some other districts in the city as well, uh, this program has not worked so hot other places. Um, I think we've been on the on the really um, the bright end of this kind of program in that Detective Oliver has been phenomenal. I mean, really above and beyond compared to anything else I've seen elsewhere in the city for this program. So I think we've been blessed that way, um, but I'm pretty sure other places have not had the same good experiences. So there are some issues that they probably need to work out. My concern here is that this is an administrative call. It's not really my call, um, but I don't want to see our level of service decrease. And so um, and I, I've talked to Eldon, we've texted a little bit, and I'm, I'm going to actually advocate for Eldon to remain um, if he chooses in this area. Um, essentially, it'd be District 1, District 2, the west side would have one captain and some other folks over it. Um, and it sounds like he's open to that. So I'm, I'm going to advocate. So if anybody wants to advocate with me, uh, I think that'd be great. I'd love to see him stay over here. Does that help at all, Ray? Thank you. Yes. Um, I, I think the, way, the point I, that you all brought up about crime in general is, is true, though. I think there's is crime is up across the board across the city. Um, whether it's the East Bench or our end of the, the city, it, it's true everywhere, um, which has also sort of strained police resources, as far as I can tell, where um, the response times from when you call 911, for instance, to when they respond has been anywhere from you know a few minutes in really extreme cases to hours um, at certain wow. times. And I think just sort of in the large spectrum, we tend to see crime increase when the economy struggles badly like it is right now. And so not to blame it all on COVID, but um, COVID is affecting all sorts of levels of this right now. So I cannot, um, I cannot hope hard enough for a vaccine and some sort of um, relief for everybody on this. Um, couple things that uh, maybe one related to that, maybe on a less positive point. Uh, the Pennywise market, people are probably aware of that on 9th West and 13th South. Um, we've had a lot of issues with that particular location for a few months now. You may have noticed if you're around there an increase in sort of activity there, which um, at first glance may seem positive, like more good community kind of uh, business. Um, but it's really not. I mean, it's really sort of stuff in the parking lot around the back, um, all sorts of problems over there. And so Detective Olivar and I have met with one of the neighbors, at least. I've had a few emails with some other neighbors uh, just in the last couple of days. And um, I don't want to get sometimes sometimes there are operations by various levels of law enforcement in situations like this that we're not aware of. 
um, whether undercover or other things. And we need to figure out if, if something is going on there. And uh, I don't want to disrupt that, but I think we got to do something about it. So um, I've been doing an intervention at North, North Temple for the last several months through the summer about some issues over there. And I'm, I'm probably going to try and pursue that here as well. So it may include some meetings with neighbors or anybody who's interested in helping sort of solve this with the owners of the Pennywise um, so we can get that sort of hot spot tamped down. Um, Thank you for recognizing Detective Oliver. He's been phenomenal, and I probably can't say that enough. I've had other interactions with other CIU detectives, uh, which have been you know, good at times and sometimes less than. And um, Detective Oliver is really by far the best I've seen, um, hands down. So uh, thank you very much again for your service and hope you stick around. Thank you. Water Park, uh, you've all probably been involved in some of the um, interaction with the city. And also, I think uh, the community council has been doing some of this to solicit neighbor input about uh, the current state demolition and what can happen there in the future. Um, we've, uh, the city council passed uh, a budget amendment to change the budget just yesterday um, to put more money towards um, security on the site through the winter and into the spring into next year, uh, 24 hours a day, which we have now. And then also um, to go ahead with the demolition, which was the outcome of the, uh, the neighborhood input. Um, the problem we have there, for those of you who haven't seen it in a while, I was just there two weeks ago again. Um, it looks infinitely worse than I ever remember it. Um, it really is in, in bad condition from uh, above ground stuff, which you can see to the pump houses. It's just been destroyed. Um, and so I, I, I still really, I want a water park in some way there. Um, I've talked to the mayor about this before. I don't know if it's going to be feasible or not, but um, we're probably going to have to start from scratch and whatever we do um, on that acre. It has to be park again. Um, it, it's, it's zoned as open space. And part of our agreement with, I think, the state of Utah back in the late 70s when it was funded and built was that it had to remain that way. So there won't be development on it that way. Um, but clearly, we're going to, the mayor seems to be very involved in this as well, too. Um, ensure it's a regional park uh, that benefits the community. So we'll keep talking about that as we go forward. Uh, demolition ordinance was passed last night, which changes the ordinance where it's, it should make it easier for folks to tear down nuisance structures. Um, there's always a threat that somebody might use it in nefarious ways to tear down structures we don't want torn down. Um, but the previous ordinance really kept it so most of the buildings you're seeing that are vacant in the neighborhood couldn't be torn down. Um, it was such a strict ordinance. So we've changed it to a place where you can tear something down if it's a problem. Um, um, if it's an historic area, there's a, a historic uh, preservation level you got to go through, some other protections for some uh, older buildings, perhaps. Um, there's some landscape requirements still. Um, so it just can't be left for, for weeds that way. And then some, uh, actually, some teeth and some fines for owners who don't take care of it. Um, and then we made a commitment to revisit it in two years and see how it's going to see if we can keep making tweaks to it over time. Uh, hopefully to deal with some of the zombie houses, um, at least some of the worst buildings. I'd love to see us renovate some of the buildings that are still in good condition though, but we'll keep working on that piece. Um, the Commission on Racial Equity and Policing is still going on. It's not directly under the council's purview. Uh, but we have funded them to um, have outside facilitators come in. We just met with um, those facilitators last week. They are very good. I uh, really uh, was impressed by them. The commission is meeting weekly, and they you can watch those online, actually, on you. Uh, I think on YouTube, actually. I think it's YouTube uh, live, or you can catch um, the, the meetings later on if you're interested. Um, but we're looking to them to give us a lot of direction, uh, both within policing, but also in the city as a whole, um, to address inequities. And then uh, you probably heard also about the fleet block. Uh, that's been a hot topic recently. Um, it's been a big issue for a number of years, at least a decade plus since it's been vacant. Um, but with the murals that have gone up, um, it's taken on a significance for a lot of community members um, as a place as memorial and they really wanna see those protected. And so when we talk some more now, it's been an ongoing discussion about the zoning of the place It became a hot, to hot topic again People are quite concerned about those being torn down for development. Um, we haven't made a decision on the rezone. The rezone is for a new zoning that really, um, right now you could build 
almost anything you want on there as long as it's not residential and it can go quite high. Um, the rezone they're proposing would be pretty broad where you can do a lot of things on it, but it would limit the height. Um, but it would allow parks, it would allow some residential, it would allow businesses, it would allow a lot of things on there. Uh, but there's still a lot of emotions around this, so we're probably going to have to keep talking about that going forward. It's probably most of the stuff, and probably more than enough for tonight, but uh, other questions I can answer? Oh, the, uh, the Sorensen, the question about the ventilation was brought up a minute ago. I think Amy did that. Um, we funded the renovation that they're doing now as part of, I think, the CIP process, the capital improvement process for the city over a couple of years, several years back. Um, if we think that's a big issue, I think talk to Sorensen um, and make sure we get their input and see what they're seeing on their end. And then if we think it's an issue, let's put it in. I'll help put it into the, the system to see if we can get it funded. One thing about that, Thank it you. is the LEED certified building. So the filtration system and the mechanical system should be pretty comprehensive already. I mean, they should be okay. using MERV 13 filters, um, et cetera. Really? It, should be, it should be a pretty good system as it is right now anyway. That's fabulous. Well, I'll ask them. I didn't know that. I, I'm just thinking COVID and indoor air. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll ask no, them. It's a pretty good sized room too, which, which is helpful. Right, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Thanks much. Any other questions for Council Member Johnston? Uh, right. Yeah, Andrew, the, the last piece that you mentioned about the site, where did you say that site was? Uh, the fleet block? The, the rezoning area that's being rezoned. Yeah, that's a, that's a whole city, well, probably eight tenths of a city block between uh, 8th and 9th South and 3rd and 4th West. Cool. If you go on 9th South East, um, it's sort of, it's got a few low buildings on it and a big open space in the middle where the city used to have a lot of their, their apparatus there and mechanical huh. stuff. Okay. It's just been open for a number of years. They've uh, used it for training and I think ongoing. Um, right. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. The city, the city owns, like I said, about eight tenths of that block, except for the run corner with a couple of uh, buildings still on it. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, with that, I'm going to move on to the next item on our agenda. We had invited Representative Romero, but I don't believe that she has joined. Um, if that's wrong, please speak up. Uh, we'll, we'll move on to uh, the UTA Rider Survey. Um, Megan Waters from Community Engagement. Hi, my name is Megan. Thanks, Turner. Um, I'm new to this group, but I just wanted to introduce myself and, and get to know you all a little bit too. So thanks for having me. I did want to um, provide an update on our survey as well as a couple of other things that might be of interest, but we did a writer survey. We've done, we've done two now, um, kind of kind of to look at our writer experience during COVID on the system. Um, things have changed a lot. Um, but this most recent survey we did in October and we received over 2000 responses. I don't have the exact responses to share with you yet, but I do wanna kind of let you know about what we asked um, folks and, and what we're going to do with that information. So because it was, there was a focus on kind of people's experience on the system during COVID, um, riding behaviors, our, our ridership has really decreased since COVID emerged. And in April, we, we decreased service levels to um, sort of adapt to the changing ridership trends. Um, in August, a lot of service came back online. And so it was, it was kind of good timing to see how, how more riders were experiencing um, the system, our response to COVID. <laughs> my, my puppy is running around behind me. So I apologize for any background <laughs> noise. Um, so we asked about riding trends during COVID, about how people thought UTA was responding to the pandemic, kind of our cleaning measures, safety on board, um, as well as rider outlook. So if people thought that they would be, for those who aren't riding during the pandemic, if they thought they would ride again in the future, and there's still, it seems a lot of uncertainty around that. People have different um, schedules going on, different um, levels of comfort with going out in public. And so there's still some uncertainty around that, which um, is to be expected. 
And we also were able to ask folks if the new levels of service were working for them. We know that taking service offline in April created some hardships for people um, in terms of connectivity and, and getting to jobs especially. So we were hoping to kind of see an improvement in that um, satisfaction with service levels. Um, so I'm happy, I'm really happy if people are interested, happy to share results when we can um, make them public. Um, happy to come back if this is of interest, um, but we'll, ha we'll have kind of more specifics to share on that if people want to um, see those numbers. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention is that we are going, it's budget season for us right now. And so if you're interested in UTA's budget, um, the 2021 budget is available for public review right now. And I can share the link to the website in the chat box and please feel free, go review if this is of interest to you and, and tell us what you think. Um, we'll have the comment period open through December 11th. So there's still plenty of time um, to weigh in if that's, if that's something you're interested in. Um, if there's any questions, I'm, I saw one come in in the chat box. Um, we did we did ask some information about routes, yes, um, and I can I'll make note of that. We haven't done the full report yet. We have only preliminary results right now, so we can look um, and kind of compare which areas we're seeing larger ridership. And uh, Lily, I'll make sure that I connect you and Megan by email so you can work directly. Uh, Lily is in, uh, working with us through University of Utah to do a community plan. Uh, awesome. So I'm assuming that data set would inform that plan. Absolutely, yeah. I'll share my contact information. Anyone, um, please feel free to reach out. I um, would love to hear from you and, and work together in the future. So I'll share my email and the budget website. If you're interested in giving us feedback, we'd appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Turner. Yep, thank you. Uh, any questions for Megan? Uh, thank you, Megan, for your time tonight. All right, uh, we'll move on then to University of Utah Dark Sky program. Hi, Turner. Um, would you make it so I can share my screen? Okay, oh, just kidding. Yes, it's already working. <laughs> okay. All right, well, hello everyone. Thank you for allowing us to speak with you all tonight. We're very excited to be here and extremely appreciative of this opportunity. My name is Julianne and I'm a student at the University of Utah in the Dark Sky Studies program. I'm also joined by my two capstone group mates, Abby and Izzy, as well as Kayla and Scarlett, who are two students from Glendale uh, who we've been working with through the Natural History Museum of Utah's Youth Teaching Youth Program. We'll also be joined by another wonderful student of America in a pre-recorded video. So tonight we're here to raise awareness about the importance of dark skies in fighting light pollution. We're going to start off our presentation today with a grounding in dark skies and light pollution, then talking about lighting inequities, and then talking about what Glendale can do to work towards becoming a dark sky friendly area. And so with that, I'm going to turn the time over to Izzy, Kayla, Scarlett, and America. Thanks, Julianne. To start us off, we're going to ask a couple of questions for you to reflect on and keep in mind throughout this presentation, as well as when we log off tonight. So when was the last time you looked up at the night sky and saw the stars? And do you have a special connection with the night sky or does your culture? So dark skies are the cornerstone of these questions. Dark skies are defined as places where the darkness of the night sky is relatively free of interference from artificial light. When talking about dark skies, a visual often referenced is the Bortle scale. As you can see, moving from left to right on the Bortle scale takes us from a city completely light polluted so that the stars are not visible, whereas on the right is a picture of a clear night sky with no light pollution. Because a lot of the population resides in urban areas, many people don't have a connection to the night sky. About one third of people on earth and 80% of Americans can no longer see the Milky Way. I'm now gonna pass the time on to Kayla and Scarlett to talk about the main causes of this phenomenon. Thanks, Izzy. So light pollution is the inappropriate excessive use of artificial light. It can also be described as misdirected or obtrusive. 
Light pollution is associated with these factors. The first is glare, an excessive brightness that causes visual discomfort. The second is clutter, which is bright, confusing, and excessive groupings of light. The third is light trespass, which is light falling where it is not intended or needed. Lastly, we have sky glow, which is the brightening of the night sky over inhabited areas. All of this comes into play when we consider safety. Researchers in Australia found that more light doesn't make a space feel more safe. When lighting is distributed poorly with glare, cluttering, and sharp drop-offs, it's hard for our eyes to adjust quickly, which impairs vision. Light pollution is also wasting energy. It is estimated that at least 30% of all outdoor lighting in the U.S. is wasted mostly by lights that aren't shielded that adds up to 3.3 billion and release of 21 million tons of carbon dioxide per year. Now that we learn about light pollution and, it, and its causes, we've become much more aware of lighting in, in our neighborhoods. And Kayla and I are going to share our experiences with it. Yeah, so I love to look up at the night sky every night but I never see any stars. This is because I live in an urban area. Um, it's very interesting to see different light fixtures throughout the city and to see how much light is being let out. Whenever I go on a drive to my local grocery store in the nighttime, I notice all the light street lights that keep the neighborhood awake. I wish I could see more of the beauty of the night sky and of course, less of unnecessary artificial light. I was actually able to experience my first dark sky on a white 2 white field trip to Bryce Canyon. It felt really good and weird to actually see stars fill the night sky. I love to look at the night sky and see the stars. I can't be completely my block from light pollution. Most of the lights come from the street lights and like the ones from the supermarket. I also experienced dark skies with Kayla in our wide to wide trip to Bryce Canyon. Thank you, Kayla and Scarlett. And now we're going to hear from America, who's going to tell us why dark skies are important. Julianne, can you stop the video? It's kind of hard to hear. Sorry, we've been having problems with the video. So I'm just going to read off what America is saying in the video. So living in a diverse neighborhood like Glendale, having dark sky friendly lighting is crucial for cultural connections. And those cultures have their own constellations and stories rooted in the stars. This includes, but is not limited to Native American, Hawaiian, African, and Chinese cultures. Light pollution prevents people from seeing the stars and robs them of cultural experiences. The improper use of artificial light does not only impact us culturally, but it also has a glaring impact on the natural world. Annually, up to 1 billion birds die from collisions caused by improper lighting in the US. In Utah, these lights are also attracting deer and their predators, mountain lions, into the cities. When we waste light, we are wasting money and energy to improperly light an area. In a crucial time to impact the course of climate change, it seems useless to waste the time and sources and resources to unintentionally damage the neighborhood. And believe it or not, we humans are a part of the negatively affected ecosystem. Blue light exposure decreases the amount of melatonin the body produces. Sleep is a crucial part of the intellectual process and without proper sleep, we are left with an inefficient society. Not to mention that proper lighting also creates a safer environment for those who are outside at night. A dark side friendly neighborhood is an inclusive, environmentally friendly and safe neighborhood. Yeah, so as America said, the world should aspire to create dark sky friendly neighborhoods which are inclusive, environmentally friendly and safe. However, as is the case with many forms of environmental injustice and inequity, many neighborhoods consisting of renter occupied housing, low income housing and racially diverse communities are disproportionately disadvantaged. The distribution of dark sky neighborhoods across the United States was studied by researchers at the University of Utah in this past year. In their report entitled Light Pollution Inequities in the Continental United States, a Distributive Environmental Justice Analysis, they found that neighborhoods composed of higher proportions of Blacks, Hispanics, Asians, or renter occupants experienced greater exposures to ambient light at night. Given that neighborhoods composed of racial and ethnic minority and renter occupant populations are disproportionately burdened by ambient light at night in the US, policy actions are needed. 
At a legislative level, the concurrent resolution encouraging the use of shielded light fixtures on outdoor lights was passed in 2018, and it does just that. It recognizes the inherent value of a starry night sky as well as the detrimental effects of light pollution on human health and our ecosystems. In its conclusion, the resolution states, now therefore be it resolved that the legislature of the state of Utah, the governor concurring therein, encourages the Utahns to transition outdoor lighting from unshielded to shielded in accordance with IDA standards in order to preserve and enhance dark skies throughout the state. Our goal tonight is to share the importance of dark skies with you all and raise awareness of light pollution. Light pollution is a collective action problem that can only be solved together and we need support to save dark skies. So as you work on the One Glendale plan, we urge you to incorporate what we've shared tonight and help us in our mission to advocate for dark skies. With that being said, here are some recommendations which you can adopt. The first is recognition. So like that Senate resolution, the Glendale Community Council should state its intentions to protect dark skies and secure a future with no light pollution. And dark skies can actually help achieve your goals in the One Glendale plan. Envisioning and creating a dark sky community can help promote a sense of neighborhood pride. Being strategic with Glendale lighting can support ecosystem health at the Three Creeks Confluence, Raging Waters property, and Bend in the River. And with one of your goals to create pedestrian friendly transportation corridors, safe lighting is essential. To demonstrate the importance of this, what do you see here? Even in a photo, the glare from this unshielded fixture makes it difficult to see. Because of this, you're unable to see this person lurking just beyond the fence. This example shows how dark sky lighting is also part of safe lighting. Recognition is the first step and action needs to follow. So to make Glendale lighting safer and more dark sky friendly, we propose having even lighting distribution. This is achieved by evenly spacing fixtures so you can see everything clearly and identify any walking or driving hazards. The second is environment appropriate lighting, which honors the different needs of different spaces. Residential, recreational, and commercial areas are all unique in their lighting needs and should be treated accordingly. And most importantly, choose dark sky friendly fixtures when you need to replace something. This means light is only projected downwards where it needs to be. This warm, slightly orangey color is the best and most comfortable for the human eye. And you can even save energy with motion sensors or dimmers. Already existing fixtures can still be made dark, dark sky compliant as well if you're retrofitting them with shielding. And lastly, be aware of your own impact. Evaluate lighting in your own space and how you're using lighting in your day-to-day -day practices. Through enacting policy and creating a dark skies plan, Glendale can be a leader in the fight to save dark skies. We'd like to wrap up by acknowledging that this is a daunting, overwhelming problem. Light pollution has gotten out of hand and has severe consequences for ecology, human health, and cultural connections. Luckily, though, addressing light pollution yields immediate results. It's as simple as the flip of a switch and the shielding of a light fixture. If we ever want to see the stars, right now is the time to take action, not just for us, but for our future generations. It's important for us to note that the Dark Skies movement isn't advocating for total darkness, but rather safe and effective lighting. With the proper lighting and advocacy for Dark Skies, we can reconnect with the night together. If you would like to get involved, here are some organizations that care very much for Dark Skies and do a lot of great work to prevent light pollution. We thank you for allowing us to speak today and we would love to answer any questions you may have during the following question and answer period. I have a question. Yes. Um, Go ahead. <laughs> I guess well, it seems all like a really great idea that I don't seem a lot of pushback to besides the cost. I mean, has there been any other pushback from the community besides the cost and to do it? Infrastructure change and stuff. Sometimes um, communities don't want to change the look of lighting fixtures that already exist. Sometimes they want to keep like a, a historical feel to um, their community. Um, but other than cost, there's 
typically not too much pushback. Um, I would add another element to what Izzy said. So in addition to keeping the cultural or historical atmosphere, one of the biggest challenges to dark skies is the concern of safety. Um, and it's important to recognize that with dark skies, we're not advocating for getting rid of completely every single light fixture so you can see the stars, but rather being very strategic with your lighting and making sure that it's pointing down, it's evenly distributed, and it does create that safe environment. So that is just another one that's typically um, brought up. Yeah, I mean, I definitely like that example of the safety because it really refutes it. And Turner, I mean, a good example is if, I mean, it's dark right now, if you go over to Indiana Avenue by the river, and you'll see on that bridge, they put on those sort of, sort of uh, faux historical lights that look sort of classic, but they're not shielded, if you notice, right? So yeah, it gives a lot of light, but it's the exact same point that's being made that we need the light, but we need it focused in certain ways. So um, I think we, we can probably take some stands or some um, requests, I guess, maybe a good way about new fixtures going in and the types and maybe have more direct impact on that. Thank you. Uh, any any other questions or comments? Uh, uh, yes, this is Ray Ray Wheeler. Um, I I want to thank these students for this presentation. I think this is a really good idea. It's very hard for people. It's like climate change, you know, to, to appreciate the importance of this for astronomers and also on the ground. Um, is difficult probably for most people to wrap their minds around why should we spend money on it, as Cody mentioned. Um, when we first moved into this neighborhood 16 years ago, we fought a battle with the Park Service who wanted to light the parkway, the Jordan River Parkway. We understand the importance of that for safety, but we did have a friend early on who was shot while walking his dog on a winter day after it had turned dark. And if you think about it, if you have very bright lighting as we have now on the Jordan River Parkway more so than ever before, your retinas close, you can't see people in the dark just as you they illustrated in this presentation. And I find myself feeling very uncomfortable in that bright lighting because I can't see what's around me in the dark. I will confess, that I've been paddling my kayak after dark at night on the Jordan River. And uh, it's interesting that the river is now so brilliantly illuminated that I can see everything perfectly well. It didn't used to be that way. The, the lights were more spaced out. Something has changed recently. I didn't notice this. But we've got more lighting than is good for wildlife. We have a little wildlife corridor here along the river. Um, we do have to provide for safety. I understand that people are concerned about that, especially uh, in a park or somewhere where there's more darkness. Uh, but I think our parks and our pathways are overlit. And I just want to express to all of you that I'm very grateful. And I would be prepared to make a motion at this moment that Glendale Community Council adopt the recommendations of this group um, whole hog and advocate for best practice as money allows. Right now we're all struggling to deal with COVID and there's always another financial crisis. But to just build into our zoning, uh, the shielded lighting, I think would be a fantastically good idea if we can justify its cost benefit. And we may be able to if it means we were using lower energy consuming lighting. So I think all these points are really good ones. I totally support this. And I'm wondering if anybody else uh, wants to uh, consider a motion to the effect of adopting this. We may wanna take more time so people can get better acquainted with the issue, but we tend to just kick these balls down the road indefinitely. So I'm ready to make a motion. 
Ray, I, I, I don't know if I'm able to, but I will second your motion if I'm able to. <laughs> and we do have sure. bylaws that work. <laughs> we have bylaws that cover almost every contingency. Check with uh, Ben Jordan about that. Uh, if, if you're willing to have some discussion on this uh, as part of the motion at this point with a second, um, the city is in the latter stages of a master lighting plan, which oh. talks about some of what they talked about as far as the right lighting for the right location, streets, sidewalks, residential, commercial, all that. I think it'd be a good time to advocate with them to, to ensure they've got the, um, the directional piece of lighting in there. Um, so it gets codified in the master plan. Therefore, it's easier to execute when they come to the neighborhood saying you want lighting, here's the options, that sort of thing. Is that is that coming soon, Andrew, to our neighborhood? For uh, well, it, it's a citywide plan that sort of lays the groundwork, but it doesn't mean they're going to do anything um, imminently in any neighborhood. But it does guide what they'll do in the future as far as the warmth of the light, which they talked about. Because if you remember when they did the LED transition to those current ones, some of them were extremely bright. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, powerful. So they're trying to rectify that, but I think this is a good thing to put in there and sure it's there. So it's in that whole plan. So there's not a debate later on about it. So Andrew, how does that happen? Do you ad go and advocate that? Does our, how does that happen? Um, well, I, I think Turner, if you guys wanna do the recommendation, like you're saying, I think you could draft a quick email to Laura Briefer at Public Utilities. Cool and see if we can just slide it in there or get a, a discussion here for you all pretty quickly. I don't think it would be that difficult, but then again, what do I know? I, I think things are simple and they end up being hard. I, I, um, I, I, I think that uh, the consensus is that folks agree we should move forward on this. Um, if it is okay with everyone on the call, instead of my second, I'd like to ask if someone else would second since I haven't looked at the bylaws on the specific issue. Yeah. I think we'll entertain a different second. Uh, second, uh, Cody, you you talked about this earlier. I'm wondering if you would like to be that second. Uh, sorry to call on someone specifically. I'm just looking at the names on the list. Or or Jeremy, if you were interested in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I certainly I would certainly su uh, support that um, and be willing to go on record as seconding that motion. Okay. Um, so I have a, a motion from Ray and a second from Jeremy. Uh, I think the way we'll do this since we're on Zoom is we'll do it by acclamation unless there's uh, someone who's on the call that's opposed. Uh, so I'll give you a second. If, if you're opposed to moving forward, please let us know. This is Dave Troster. I'm opposed only by process. It's Seems like you're, I'm not sure what you're adopting. It's, it was completely a PowerPoint plan. You've proven the idea. I, I, Andrew's right. The city did have a committee and there's an overall plan. But anyway, I'm not, I'm not opposed to the idea of good lighting. I just want to know what you're approving. And I'd like to see something in writing if you're going to approve it. But that's just me. So if I, if I can restate what Ray was motioning, he was motioning that we'd accept their recommendations as spelled out in their presentation and incorporate them into the one Glendale plan uh, at large. Is that correct, Ray? Yes. And perhaps also into the new RDA um, nine line community area, uh, if and when that's adopted or, or um, when it goes into effect. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm Andrew, is there, do you have any update on that? Um, I, I don't on that one. I was thinking of the citywide master plan for all lighting across the entire city. If this, I think pieces of this are built in, but ensuring that it was more, ensuring that it is there in the way that uh, um, we think would be helpful. That way, when they come and say, here's a, or we petition for a, a lighting upgrade on the nine line uh, street in the parks, wherever it is on, in Glendale, then they would come up and say, well, here's our approved master plan of the types of down lighting. Um, so it can still be historically sort of nice and still um, be responsible. Hi, um, I'd like to jump in for a second, if I may. Hi, uh, sorry, my, I'm on my phone, so my camera's not gonna work. My name is uh, Dr. Daniel Mendoza and I'm the professor 
of the Dark Sky Studies minor. So these are my students. First of all, I want to say thank you very much for giving us the platform to speak and for being so open to our suggestions. And I think all the students did a great job. Uh, to answer specifically the question about the Streetlight Master Plan, I was actually approached by, uh, by the team that is going to develop that and they had Dark Skies in mind. So they asked a panel of us who work in Dark Skies uh, to take a look at this. They did two iterations of that. And as far as I can tell, at least up until I think early summer was the last time they consulted us, they had this in mind for the whole city that, for example, all the new light fixtures would be the correct uh, Kelvin temperature, the correct LED color, and they would be fully shielded. However, what I think would be very important and powerful would be for you as a community council to go back to them and say that you're on board with this and that you're fully supporting this. Because I think the more community councils uh, that, that reach out to them and say that they're in support of them, uh, the, the, the stronger sort of the impetus will be. Uh, next week, uh, sorry, at the beginning of December, my other group of students is half of my class. The other group of students will be speaking at the Rose Park Community Council as well. Fairly similar materials, uh, and that's the other half of my class. If you're interested in also participating or being in attendance, that would be great. But I think a, a really good suggestion would be if you just uh, approach uh, the city master plan, um, the lighting master plan group, and then say that you've heard the students and that you're on board with this, it will, it will, it will make a difference. Great, thank you. Um, with that, I'd like to go back to the motions. Um, if not, let's see. Um, so it sounds like there, I'd like to propose a little bit of a compromise. So hearing uh, DP's concern about the process of this, I'm wondering if what we could amend, if Ray, if you would be amenable to, to amending your motion to be that the community council will pursue this and come back to the community at our January or December meeting with a full proposal for what we actually plan to do as a community council with some specifics and some better ideas. And, and one of our board members can work with the students and, and uh, Dr. Mendoza and others to really bullet point out what that would look like. And then we can bring it back for council consideration. But I don't think there's disagreement about moving forward, but maybe, uh, we need to do a little bit more due diligence to, to, to have a formal proposal. Yeah, this council used to have a rule, as I recall, that we don't vote on a resolution in the meeting in which it's mm -hmm. advanced, or maybe that was the city council. No, that was the city council that had that rule. I don't know if they still following it, but yeah, I'm fine with that as long as we make a commitment to a time frame. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would say December or January's meeting. The only reason I say or is if we're not able to get all the information between now and the next meeting. Sure, that's fine. Great. Uh, uh, Turner, I have a real quick comment, if I may. Yes, sorry, and, I can't uh, see who's speaking. Amy O'Connor. Okay. Uh, and and not, nothing to do with that, that resolution. I just also wanna thank Daniel and his team of students. I'm so impressed. This is an example of young people actually influencing policy, which I think is awesome. And I would suggest somebody brought up the West View earlier, bring this to the West View that may be something they can roll into one of their issues about the West Side. I think it needs to be spread more broadly so that more people understand the dark sky initiatives that are going on all over the country and presumably the world. So thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, Amy. and. Uh... And to the presenters, the, the Westview will be following up with you after this, uh, after this meeting. <laughs> uh, so with that, it, it sounds like Ray's amended motion is just for the community council to move forward and come back with a formal proposal in January. Jeremy, did you still want to second that? Yes, that'll be fine. All right. Uh, so if it's okay with everyone, we'll move forward with a vote by uh, uh, acclamation. So unless there's opposition to it, um, which I'll give anyone who, who is opposed the opportunity to speak up. Uh, with that, I'm just going to rule that the motion passed for us to move forward and we'll come back with a formal proposal at either the December or January meeting. Um, with that, we've concluded our 
uh, formal meeting. What I wanted to do, I saw that Ashley joined our vice chair and wanted to see, Ashley, if you wanted to talk about the, uh, the, the development proposal you've been working on for out west. I'm struggling with the words. I can't remember exactly what it is. She may have stepped away. Um, the monopole, is that what you're talking about? The the pole, the telephone pole thing. Yeah, right. so we were looking into it um, and we just, there, there's it's right next to the landfill and the wetland bird refuge. And they wanna put, I think an 80 foot pole instead of their standard 60 foot pole, uh, which is just a, communica a communications tower. Uh, and we were thinking there's no issues with it. And then we started thinking about the bird refuge just right there. And we just wanted some input from anyone in the community if they were kind of against it. Birds can, like, can fly into those objects and, and get killed. Also the electromagnetic radiation can harm birds. So once we thought about that, we weren't, and we don't know if there's any, gonna be any lighting on the tower. So if anyone wanted to so you put, uh, you put out a, 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 um, a survey, didn't you? Or? Yeah, I put on a survey. I haven't checked the results of it. Um, so I, it's good that we're having a community meeting if anyone in the community wants to talk about it or if they have any concerns with it. Um, we can also maybe just send our letter with our concerns and see what they have to say, if there's going to be lighting on the pole on the tower or anything like that before we send them the letter of approval or concern. So Ashley, are, are you providing people with any data then that shows the adverse effects of these things? Because I don't um, know. I, I did post two links. I didn't get too far into it. Um, there's, there's been a lot of studies done in India about how it has affected bird populations wow. and specifically sparrows but it doesn't seem to be like super harmful. It's, it's nothing too crazy. So once we just kind of thought about that, the fact that it's right next to a bird refuge was mm -hmm. worrying some, but then at the same time, it's also right next to a landfill. So that can't be too helpful for the, for the birds either. So we're just not sure what we want to include in our letter. I was wondering if there, is there an appropriate organization that I guess would have a possible opinion on this. I was just thinking like Sierra Club or kind of something yeah. that study. That's a good idea. I can reach out to the local Sierra Club advocate somewhere in our area and see if they have anything to say about it. That's a good idea. Ash Ashley, I'll also get you the contact uh, information for the Audubon Society. I think this may be of interest to them even more specifically. Okay, I'll, I'll look into that as well. And for those who are listening, uh, I posted the link in both the chat here on Zoom and on Facebook. So you can click through and read more about the proposal that we're talking about. Yeah, and then you can also let us know on our Instagram post or on our Facebook uh, or through our website. I believe you can contact us through that if you want to let me know about anything regarding that. Um, with that, I want to make one final announcement um, before we wrap up tonight. We, uh, one of the things that we've talked about um, as a board is how difficult it is to have long conversations about specific topics in a community council meeting. So we um, have been discussing and, and coming up with a plan to host community conversations, which would be more free flowing about a given topic. So an example would be crime and public safety, where we would invite uh, Detective Oliver and, and other authorities to come and talk more broadly and, and have a full hour or additional time. Um, as great as we, or as much as we love to talk about these topics at the community council meeting, we tend to run out of time and we wanna make sure that we're spending an adequate amount of time um, discussing these issues. So the three that we have planned are crime and safety, um, homelessness and kind of the, the response to, to unsheltered folks, and then transportation and kind of pedestrian access issues in the, uh, the, the community. If you can think of other topics, 
please contact me and let me know and we'll get, get organizing those. Uh, with that, does anyone have any last comments or thoughts? Yeah. All right. Turner, um, you just reminded me, if folks, um, I know Dave brought up a question earlier about some campers um, near Bend in the River. Um, we know there's a lot of unsheltered folks right now. There, there is active work being done to identify at least two locations for overflow shelter outside the city. One of which is probably imminent within a week or so. I'm hoping if that other city will take action. Um, they ran into a roadblock in Midvale last week with another site they had chosen. That's not going to happen. So they're still trying to work on that. So there should be more overflow opening up, hopefully as soon as possible. So folks can get in out of the cold sooner than later. Thank you. Uh, uh, oh, who was that? I'd like to, this is Ray. Um, this issue of homeless people is one that I've given lots of thought to, and it's tough. I mean, Andrew's given more thought than probably anybody in the city, but um, I think that would be a great topic for an extended conversation. If you want to add that, Turner, uh, it's, I, I'd be interested in knowing if anyone in the whole country and some of our sister cities all over the country has worked out a protocol for what to do with people that are hanging out in, and living in public space. It's really, I mean, we had just a year or two ago, we had, uh, you know, a homeless group built a pod underneath one of the bridges over the, jo over the Jordan River and they, they sealed it at the top and the bottom and, and they put in styrofoam. I mean, they were living there for months and we have other transit camps like that. They're having to move around now as we do more with the Jordan Parkway Trail, but that is worthy of, and it's something that bothers, I think it, Andrew can, would know better than I do, but I, I, in my discussions with my neighbors, I have heard a lot of conversation about this problem. And when you look at it from the homeless person's point of view, it looks different. And it's, it's a troubling problem for every urban area, I think, in the whole US. It would be great if we could tap into the, the common wisdom about this. There probably are best practices uh, I just don't know how to deal. I mean, what do you do when you see one of these camps coming up? You call the police. I guess they come in and and remove those people. But do we have the sh shelter facilities? Do they are they willing to go to the shelter? It's a big subject. I won't ask Andrew to comment on it right now. We'd be on this call for another hour. But I would like to see it. I love your idea, Turner, about having these more extended conversations. I think you'll find those well attended and this would be a, another good one to do. Yeah, I would really like to see two major meetings happen with, I think we need way more uh, transparency, transparency from our police representative. I think we need to have a very deep conversation about what is happening, not just from the recent events in America, that's one thing, but also just what's happening in our own neighborhood. And I don't feel like there has been a proper discussion for the past 24 months. And I think there's just been a lot of um, fake smiles along with these discussions. And then as well with the homelessness, and I think that's also even related with the police talk. If you follow a group called the Brown Barrettes, they talk about it uh, as one, the city isn't providing anything for them. And then we just call the cops and then remove them. And none of that is a solution. And we could just have really long talks. That's really what I want to see. I'm sorry, you said it's not really what you want to see? No, it, I, I want to see uh, long discussion meetings. I want to see, I want us to have a meeting where yeah. we dive into these topics and actually have a full discussion about it because we don't have any solutions happening. And I don't personally feel like there's enough transparency from maybe our city board or from our police officers in our area. And I, I'm just not seeing the things that they're promising. And I haven't seen them happen for over 24 months. So I agree with you. I think we need to have long talks about it. 
back at you, Ashley. Well, I yeah, I agree. I just, uh, I'm a housing case manager for chronically homeless and I just know that the like police aren't equipped, unfortunately, to deal with the problem, which it, it sucks that that is the issue, but it would be nice if there was a localized solution, hopefully maybe a group of residents that could go out and engage with them. I mean, cause I do that on a daily basis, but mm. that seems just, I've talked to Turner just about a possible community council kind of outreach team that would work with them. Because from my understanding, like I, there's a lot of funding for for housing vouchers and solutions and it's just kind of bridging that connection but it seems like we have a lot to talk about <laughs> yeah and and i i definitely know that we have a lot of lot to talk about i'm very interested in making sure residents are connected to the providers as well because i think there is a significant amount going on in terms of providing services and trying to fill these gaps and i think it's important that we engage in good faith with the providers that are working so hard and the city's outreach team. Um, so uh, this is a great illustration of why we want to have longer opportunities to talk about these topics. Um, with that, if there's no, no last minute comments on anything, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, move to adjourn the meeting given that we're coming up on our hour and a half mark. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Take care. Thanks.